All right. Well, I think we should go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds um, this uh, April 11th. Um, I am delighted to have the opportunity to introduce my colleague, Dr. Varun Fadke. Dr. Um, Fadke is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of uh, Infectious Disease at Emory, but importantly, he is also the assistant vice chair for clinical reason of education for clinical reasoning in the Department of Medicine. And it is um, for uh, uh, some of the, the, for that reason that I uh, wanted to invite him to give this uh, talk today. Um, Dr. Feike graduated from Harvard Medical School. He did his residency um, at Columbia University and his ID fellowship at Emory. Um, and after completing that, joined um, faculty at Emory, where he has quickly become a um, master clinician and beloved educator. He's passionate about teaching and assessing clinical reasoning and medical decision-making skills, and has previously participated in the Diagnosis Learning Collaborative and a Fellowship in Diagnostic Excellence, both of which were sponsored by the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine, SDIM. He, in addition to his uh, vice, assist, assistant vice chair role, he serves as the associate program director for the ID Fellowship Program, director of the core medicine M3 clerkship um, for the uh, medical students, and assist in, um, and uh, and has um, a central role in teaching microbiology for um, the medical students in their preclinical years as well. So, um, Dr. Fike Varun, thank you so much for agreeing um, to give this talk. I am, you know, really um, excited to sort of hear you help us think about how to address um, clinical cases, um, both in presentations and honestly also as how, uh, to help us think about how to make our skills better. And, uh, and yes, um, Carlos's comment is, is also true. So take it away. Uh, thanks, Wendy, for that kind introduction. Uh, can you see my screen? We definitely can. Okay, great. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to talk to you about something uh, about which I've become very passionate over the last two years. Um, and I think something that is really sort of a ubiquitous part of all of our experience as clinicians in an academic environment, which is clinical case conferences. Um, and despite the fact that they are ubiquitous, I think there are a lot of opportunities for us to be more intentional about how we plan and design them and execute them to, to maximize their educational impact. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so um, just to disclose a couple of things, I do serve as a reviewer for a couple of educational products related to clinical reasoning, but I will not be discussing either of those products today. Um, I wanted to start by acknowledging uh, Dr. Armstrong and the Department of Medicine really for creating this opportunity uh, for me to talk about something that is so integral to our experience as uh, clinicians in, in an academic environment, as I described. Um, and being very intentional and thoughtful about um, uh, innovating in this space. I also wanted to uh, acknowledge uh, colleagues who I've worked with here at Emory, uh, Dr. Spicer and Dr. Laura, as well as a colleague outside, colleagues outside of Emory, Dr. Jagannath and Dr. Daliwal, who have uh, shared a lot of their wisdom with me um, in, as educators, um, specifically as it uh, pertains to designing clinical case conferences. So um, here are my learning objectives for this afternoon. Um, just big picture, I'm gonna sort of start with some historical perspective about what I mean when I talk about clinical case conferences and, and how the conferences we all know and love today came about. Um, we'll use that perspective then to really dive in deep and do a, a really granular dissection of how we can design case conferences more effectively to, uh, to improve uh, our uh, learning from them. And then finally, uh, sort of brainstorm with you ways that we can innovate our own case conferences in the Department of Medicine, but in subspecialty divisions as well, uh, to have even greater impact on our learners. So let's start with uh, what I even mean by case conferences. And, and to do that, really, I'm going to get to get really meta, I'm going to actually present a case through the course of this presentation and use it to illustrate some of the principles that I talk about. So this is the case of a patient uh, of a 70 year old woman who presented to her physician with three weeks of nausea, early satiety, generalized abdominal pain, unintentional 10 pound weight loss. Uh, 
Uh, she had diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and CKD. Uh, she was born in India and had lived in the United States for over 30 years. Um, she did not use tobacco, alcohol, or any recreational drugs. So as you ponder that first little bite of uh, clinical information, um, let's pause and ask ourselves, how could we dissect this case for large group educational purposes? So to do that, let's take a little interlude and reflect on conferences that we attend regularly. And that could include CPC at Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. It could be a recurring conference in a training program uh, that you are affiliated with that uh, where cases are presented for teaching purposes. Um, it could be challenging case sessions at your professional society meetings. I want you to think about the one that you sort of feel most attached to of these and ask yourself, why do you go? Why do we carve out time when we're not seeing patients to go and hear about more patients? Um, what makes these sessions successful or unsuccessful when they are as such? And what features of these sessions lead to better learning? And I think all of us probably recognize that there is a lot of serendipity associated with the success of these sessions. Uh, like it was a good case or the discussant happened to discuss it well, um, or it was just the right amount of content that got presented at the moment that you happen to be attending the conference. Um, but I think that there are ways for us to build these conferences in a more uh, intentional way that does not rely on just serendipity to make them effective. So let's talk about some history, the evolution of clinical case conference. So as I've already mentioned, they are a ubiquitous element of graduate and continuing medical education. Uh, they remain an ever popular uh, sort of conference format at professional society meetings, uh, are, are uh, often the most uh, well attended of uh, sessions at these society meetings and in surveys of internal medicine residency programs are consistently rated as the highest uh, sort of uh, educational value sessions in, in, the, in those programs. Um, but over the last few decades, there has definitely been a decline in their role in venues like uh, medical grand rounds. Um, so this was actually an editorial published uh, in 2006 in the New, in the, in the New York Times um, that talked about sort of the, the gradual decline of the Socratic dialogue style uh, clinical case conferences of old um, and their replacement with PowerPoint presentations about the, the, the latest and greatest advances in biomedical science um, and how case presentations had become a smaller and smaller proportion of medical grand rounds at internal medicine programs around the country. Um, I think that's happened for a variety of reasons. Um, I think care has become increasingly subspecialized, which makes it harder and harder for case conference planners to find cases that feel relevant to everyone in the audience. Um, as a subspecialist, um, is uh, what, what am I to take away from the presentation of a case of a patient that I may never encounter in my own practice? Um, another, I think, important element is that CPCs uh, may be perceived as less academically rigorous than uh, a comprehensive review of the literature or similar type presentation. And I think that has led many conference planners to focus on the entertainment aspect of clinical case conferences, uh, which further limits their role in venues like medical grain rounds. So let's ask ourselves, what do we even mean when we say clinical case conference? So I'm gonna show this uh, screenshot of an article published in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal in 1900. Um, this is uh, the predecessor journal to the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and this is the author of this paper is Walter Cannon, who at the time was a student at Harvard Medical School. Um, and he wrote this article, The Case Method of Teaching Systematic Medicine, uh, which was sort of a, an opinion piece really uh, from a student at the time to describe um, how could the teaching of medicine be better? And I thought it was uh, amusing to actually read this article, given that it was from 123 years ago, to find the same kind of uh, opining that we all engage in now. Things like, among many instructors, there is manifest dissatisfaction with the traditional means of training physicians, a dissatisfaction apparently from the belief that the teaching of medicine has not been keeping pace with improvements in the teaching of other subjects. 
Or why should medical students be expected to reason clearly in medical matters, weigh conflicting evidence, or draw just conclusions when their chief practice is taking lecture notes? Um, and the title of this article, The Case Method of Teaching, uh, is drawn from uh, Dr. Cannon's roommate at the time, who was actually enrolled in Harvard Law School. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with education, uh, educational methods in law schools, it is the case method approach. Uh, so the case method approach was introduced by Christopher Columbus Langdell, um, who was the dean of Harvard Law School in the late 19th century. Um, and he introduced it and, and adopted it really as the primary and sole method of instruction at Harvard Law School in 1870. And initially it was extremely unpopular. Um, leading to actually a decline in enrollment at Harvard Law School for several years after its adoption, uh, but eventually, uh, I think, gained popularity and now is the predominant mode of instruction at every law school in the United States and, and, and in many other countries as well. Um, and so how does case method teaching work? Well, instead of lectures, students are assigned curated collections of cases in case books, which are really just settled judicial opinions. Um, students are then expected to read those cases, either individually or in small groups, and extract legal principles from them. Um, and then they come together in a large group where teachers employ the Socratic method to probe and test the student's understanding of the underlying legal problem and the nuances of case law. The evolution of this was into the case study method, uh, which was adopted as the primary mode of instruction at Harvard Business School in 1920. Um, and in this uh, approach, uh, instead of curated collections of solved cases, students are assigned real business scenarios with an uncertain solution. They are expected to read those cases and problem solve. Um, and then in the large group, when learners come together, teachers employ the Socratic method to probe and test their students' understanding of the underlying business dilemma and potential solutions. And those of you who are involved in small group instruction at our medical school or who have done it at other medical schools probably see echoes of this in the problem-based learning of uh, current medical education, um, though with notable differences in terms of uh, sort of the structuredness of the learning goals um, and the large group Socratic format. So it's really from these two sort of methods that were developing in the early 20th century that uh, the case conference in medicine was born. So um, here's that uh, sort of opinion piece in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal uh, that gave rise to a book uh, like this. Uh, and there are many from that time period called Case Teaching in Medicine, a series of graduated exercises in differential diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment of actual cases of disease. The author of this particular book is Richard Cabot, a physician at Massachusetts General Hospital at the time, who used to actually have cases presented to physicians and had the dialogue between the discussant and the audience sort of taken down uh, uh, and recorded. And he compiled those into the case records of the Massachusetts General Hospital, which you now recognize as an article format, recurring article format in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, it's actually timely. This is, this is actually the 100th anniversary of the case records of the Massachusetts General Hospital as an article type in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this is really where Clinical Pathologic Conference or CPC Conference was born from. Key features of it being that an expert clinician has presented a case in whole case format and asked to present their clinical diagnosis. And then a pathologist actually reveals the definitive diagnosis. And the focus of these CPC conferences was just that, it was definitive diagnosis. Uh, for, for many decades, the, the primary organizers and editors of the case records were pathologists. Um, the individuals who were finding these, these misdiagnoses in the pathology lab and then interacting with the clinicians who were taking care of the patient uh, to see if there were ways to make our diagnostic thinking more efficient and more accurate. So to answer this question, one, what is clinical case conference? Many of you may think to CPC. There are certainly a lot of other formats that I wanted to highlight here. So there's m, &M conference, which again was born from another physician, uh, Dr. Ernest Codman, who was very interested in looking at outcomes of uh, surgical patients. He actually created a Codman classification to understand uh, 
and, and differentiate uh, errors that occurred as a result of an individual surgeon's mistake versus systems type errors uh, versus errors, uh, adverse events that occurred as a result of the disease process itself. Uh, from that sort of patient outcome focus uh, was born m and conference where an error is analyzed, presented, and discussed. Um, but as we all know, there has been an, a, a, a dramatic evolution of m and conference over the last many decades, uh, where it has shifted from an analysis or review of individual error, which is what it was when it was primarily a surgical review of patient outcomes, to identification of systems-level problems uh, with systems-level solutions. Um, so that's another type of clinical case conference, dissecting an individual case for educational purposes. Um, I think those of us in subspecialty divisions uh, recognize uh, show and tell type conferences as very near and dear to our curricula, where interesting cases are presented and supplemented with a focused literature review. And sort of the emergence of this format came hand in hand uh, with sort of a conversation about the ongoing utility of CPC. So this was a count, uh, a point counterpoint type article published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, now almost 50 years ago, uh, where they really debated, should we even still publish the CPCs? Um, and I think uh, the argument against was that they had become increasingly discussions of more and more esoteric diagnoses. Um, and really just an opportunity for an experienced clinician to showcase their esoteric knowledge um, versus uh, real utilization of them uh, for teaching uh, diagnostic reasoning. And I think this dilemma arose because uh, there was real uh, debate in the medical community about whether diagnostic uncertainty was even still a thing. Um, this, these two graphs are from a study uh, published in JAMA looking at the predicted rates of missed diagnoses found at autopsy. And you can see over the five decades of data that were summarized in that, in that review, there's been a gradual decrease in the number of missed diagnoses. I won't go into the y-axis here where the rates of diagnose, missed diagnoses are actually still pretty significant. Um, but there's this real sense that you know, we no longer have uncertainty about diagnosis. Should we still be spending time talking about how to reach diagnosis in educational conferences? Um, and I think that's where this sort of shift towards spending more time focusing on the evidence and the literature became uh, sort of a, an intrinsic component of our educational conferences. And then finally, I think the, the newest development is clinical problem solving conferences or CPS style conferences. And this was born from a movement in the 70s and 80s uh, to understand the, the clinical reasoning processes that expert clinicians use and, and really differentiate them from novice clinicians. And this gave birth, for example, to the clinical problem-solving format in the New England Journal of Medicine, which uh, started in 1992 to more even to the lay press with the diagnosis featured article in the New York Times by Lisa Sanders. And then in the last of decades, really an explosion of resources online and on social media um, uh, and podcasts and apps uh, to understand clinical problem solving, um, where an expert clinical teacher is presented a case in serial queue format and asked to share their reasoning after each aliquot of case information. So these are sort of the four genres of clinical case conference that exist, and no conference necessarily leans only into one. I think every conference we attend has a piece of all of them. Um, and so to compare and contrast them with what was the genesis of case-based teaching, case method and case study teaching, um, here we can add medical clinical case conferences, which really are often an amalgam of CPC, m and and CPS um, with some key differences. So solved cases are presented. Um, there's very little actually preparatory work on the part of learners. Um, they are simply presented a case in a large group format with little Socratic dialogue. Um, and the goal is for learners to hear how experienced clinicians think through cases. And I think the unifying characteristic of all of them is that cases are not the ends, but the means of learning. So with that historical perspective, now let's turn to um, 
some ways for us to more granular, granularly improve the way we deliver these conferences to achieve what their goal used to be, which was to think about uncertainty. So to do that, let's come back to the case that I started the presentation with. Just to remind you, this is a 70-year-old woman presenting with some subacute abdominal symptoms and weight loss. So some additional information. She, uh, on initial evaluation of those symptoms, her exam was notable for a non-tender, firm, palpable right supraclavicular lymph node. An FNA biopsy of the lymph node revealed a benign reactive lymph node with negative flow cytometry findings. Over the next three weeks, the patient developed intermittent fevers, lethargy, and jaundice, prompting her presentation to the emergency department. On examination, her temperature was 99 degrees. Her blood pressure was 135 over 61. Her heart rate was 108. Her respiratory rate was 16, and her oxygen saturation was 97% on room air. She was lethargic, arousable to her name, but disoriented to time and place. Pertinent exam findings included scleral icterus and abdominal distension with mild right upper quadrant tenderness upon palpation. So with that, as you ponder that additional clinical case information, let's pause again and think about what are some of the reasons we don't enjoy clinical case conferences when we go to them? So I've sort of categorized those reasons into three big uh, uh, buckets. So sometimes the issue is the case. We might remember asking, saying to ourselves or a colleague saying to themselves, well, it was obviously this, or I'll never see this again. Why, why should I? That, that was a waste of my time. Are you even sure it was X when there's doubt in the diagnosis that was even presented? Sometimes there's an issue with the discussion where the discussant didn't really add much to the teaching. The discussion was inaccessible. It was completely esoteric above everyone's head, or the discussion was tangential where the discussant sort of decided to co-opt the agenda of the session and, and, uh, and take the audience down a different direction. And sometimes the issue is the content where it was too basic or too esoteric or simply too much. And I think all of these issues arise from a misalignment between the goals and the fears of the key stakeholders in the planners of these conferences, the presenters, the discussants, and the attendees. And I'm gonna break down each one and share some educational theory and, and principles that I think we should be applying more uniformly to ensure the success of these conferences. So let's start with the case presenters who are often struggling to teach something memorable, um, but worry a lot about not teaching enough. And I think this again comes from that perception that uh, CPCs are maybe perceived as less academically rigorous and, and therefore need to be stuffed with as much content as possible. And this, uh, the problem with these, with these goals and fears is that it often dissuades organizers from focusing on bread and butter problems or areas of uncertainty or practice variation. Um, and it prioritizes the transmission of medical knowledge over skill building or fostering of reflective practice. So what's one solution that I'm gonna offer here? That solution is to target the zone of proximal development. So some of you may be familiar with the zone of proximal development. If you are not, the zone of proximal development is a concept in educational psychology um, that really refers to uh, the place where we think learning uh, learners are likely to experience uh, the most efficient acquisition of new skills or knowledge. So let me diagram this for you. Um, here are three circles, three zones where a learner might reside. Um, in the blue zone is uh, experiences where the learner can already do the suggested task without any aid or guidance. So think about, for example, a toddler or a five-year-old who is riding a bike with training wheels or riding a tricycle, right? Something that they can already do. The red zone is uh, where the learn what the learner cannot do even with aid and guidance. This is a task that is beyond their capabilities. Um, so for example, that same toddler or five-year-old uh, riding a bike without training wheels. And I think there were two sort of theories of skill acquisition that existed at the time that the zone of proximal development hypothesis was conceived. 
which is that learners transition from the blue zone to the red zone as a course, uh, as, a, as a product of developmental maturity. So as time passes, um, uh, learners through just simply more experience gain the ability to do the thing that they were not previously able to do. And in that sort of mode of thinking, the teacher's task is simply to provide learners with opportunities to do those things that they cannot currently do, just to expose them to, to tasks that are currently beyond their ability um, so that they keep experiencing them again and again and again uh, until they can finally do them. The zone of proximal development, the thesis of this, of this concept, um, is based on the premise that learning is a social activity uh, where the teacher actually plays a more intentional role in this transition and actually takes advantage of this green zone in the middle, which is the zone of proximal development, where the learner may possess some knowledge in the blue zone, but the learner has some problem-solving ability that the teacher can scaffold experiences onto um, to transition them more deliberately from the blue zone to the red zone. So this is like the teacher who takes that child who is using training wheels and has them ride their bike without training wheels, um, uh, but holding them along the way. So providing them with graduated activities um, that build on prior knowledge intentionally. So the most learning, obviously, in this, in this model occurs here in the zone of proximal development. So it's not really what your learner can already do, but what your learner could do with some of your guidance. So how do we apply this thinking to instructional design? So here are some examples of the different zones for clinical teaching, right? So you're rounding with learners in the clinical environment, asking your learners to recite facts about pathophysiology. That's something they can already do without assistance. Giving them a talk that you have created previously for much more sophisticated learners to early M3 students, that's squarely outside of their capacity and simply providing them with time and exposure to things that they cannot currently do isn't going to make that transition easier. In contrast, engaging the team to formulate and defend a differential diagnosis for a common complaint scaffolds that task, builds on things that they already know, and allows them to transition to the independent task much more explicitly. So how do we do this when we select cases for CPC? Well, I think most of us, uh, when we plan conferences, uh, um, we end up choosing uh, cases that are in the red zone. We, we, we try to choose cases that are diagnostic or management dilemmas for everyone in the audience for fear of accidentally choosing a case that's in the blue zone. We don't want to bore anyone who comes to our case conference. And in order to avoid that, we pick such esoteric cases um, that are so unfamiliar to the audience that we actually make it difficult and inaccessible for people to enjoy them. In contrast, what we should really be doing is finding cases that authentically replicate clinical dilemmas that we all share, regardless of our subspecialty, and then provide us with a framework for approaching them more uniformly. So how do we find these cases? So we historically have selected cases to impart medical knowledge. And as a result, we end up focusing on zebras. We end up focusing uh, and looking for cases based on the diagnosis. Um, in contrast, we really should be prioritizing cases that illustrate the cognitive process. And that relies on an understanding of the components of the cognitive processes that underlie diagnostic reasoning and management reasoning, which I have depicted here. And I'm not going to dive into those in great detail. I've done that in, in other presentations, and I'm, and I'm happy to share these with you um, if you are interested. Um, but recognizing that the way we think about patients is actually um, shared among all of us, um, and that we can build those skills in a more intentional way, even if we already all know what the diagnosis is, can actually lead to a more effective conference. We can also look at this same process through the lens of the deliberate practice literature. So um, on this table here, I've, I've aligned different tasks that we all engage in, but categorize them as general practice, basically just doing the same thing again and again and again. Purposeful practice where you're doing it with some goal in mind, 
And then deliberate practice, where you are doing the same task repetitively with a goal and actually seek feedback about it in a proactive way. So we tell our learners often to see patients or read more. Um, instead, we should be telling them to uh, repeat specific patient care tasks or reading in a very directed way. But ultimately, to get better at reasoning, we should be seeking feedback on those activities. And we can apply that same logic to CPC. So simply skimming CPCs in every month's New England Journal of Medicine or logging on for CPC at Grand Rounds is just general practice. Attending them and reading them with some intentionality is purposeful practice. But as conference designers, we can curate cases and actively engage our audience in a scaffolded analysis of clinical reasoning processes uh, to help us all build towards the same skill level intention. So I wanna push us beyond finding just interesting cases. Um, all of us, I'm sure in our EMR have a folder or a patient list called interesting cases. And I'm willing to bet that all of the patients in that list are there because of their diagnosis. Um, but I wanna push us beyond that um, and, and learn from the storytelling literature that exists. So here's, here's a book that I recently read about uh, how do the moth storytellers identify the best stories for this now sort of revered podcast. And it is the use of emotional valence. So asking yourself, what, what are the cases where I missed the diagnosis or where I was scared during the care of the patient? or where I was surprised about what happened, or where I wrestled with the right thing to do, meaning there was no obvious answer that I could just look up, or where there, there was a problem um, that the case reflected a problem in medicine that spoke to me. Um, these are the cases that I think actually make for the richest CPCs, not only the esoteric diagnoses uh, where no one in the audience will be familiar uh, with what's going on. So that I think is one approach to tackling the common dilemma of identifying cases for case content. So discussants I think also play a role in uh, affecting the educational uh, value of clinical case conferences. So discussants have the goal of sharing their unique expertise, but also fear looking dumb. And I think this leads to some challenges for conference organizers. Um, it means that we often prioritize content expertise over teaching expertise. It also dissuades us from keeping our discussions truly blinded or using the serial cue format intentionally. So the solution to this, in my view, is really to be deliberate about controlling cognitive load for our audience. So just uh, uh, to remind those of you who are familiar with cognitive load theory or to introduce it to those of you who are not, Cognitive load theory is really just a model of information and information processing in the human mind. There are three aspects of information processing, sensory memory, which is basically all the information input that we are experiencing at any given time, which is transmitted into working memory, which is like our scratch pad, which then interacts with long-term memory. Some of the things in our scratch pad end up in long-term memory. We also retrieve information from long-term memory into our scratch pad and use it to um, understand what's incoming through sensory memory. The cognitive load really refers to the information that we are experiencing at any given time. And you can see that the, the bottleneck in this system processor is working memory, which has a finite capacity. Therefore, it is incumbent on us as educators to be very mindful of cognitive load when we're designing a conference. So what are the different components of cognitive load and how we, should we use them uh, when we're designing uh, educational activities? So one component is intrinsic load, which is basically how difficult or complex the material is. You wouldn't choose to teach renal tubular acidosis to a brand new medical student, or for that matter, an infectious diseases faculty member like myself, um, in the same way, we should be thinking intentionally about how we uh, choose cases for a uh, clinical case conference. So we try to match content to the learner level in our lectures. We should also select cases that align their difficulty or complexity with the members of the audience. We've kind of already discussed this in choosing cases that replicate 
clinical dilemmas that are likely to be experienced by everyone in the audience, uh, not simply based on what the diagnosis is. Extraneous load is, uh, refers to factors that influence information processing that are irrelevant to the learning task. So this is like in a lecture where you have too many words on the screen or too many arrows in your diagram. It's information that is there that takes up space in working memory that is actually not needed to transform that working memory into long-term memory. And this is, happens commonly in, in case conferences where we include case details that are irrelevant to the learning goals of that conference. So think back to the four types of clinical case conferences, and I'll use m and as an example, where the, the focus of the conference is a specific adverse event or error, but we spend an inordinate amount of time going over aspects of the case that were irrelevant to that adverse event or error. For example, social history or family history, um, or labs, or whatever it might be, um, and we we then uh, waste precious time for meaningful dialogue between case presenters and audience uh, to really learn from that case. Um, but the aspect of cognitive load that I want to focus on really is germane load, um, and this is an effort that the learner needs to make to link working and long-term memory. And we do this when we design lectures where we use uh, retrieval or scaffolding or worked examples to enhance learning. So we present a table on the screen that's only partly filled out, and then have our learners fill it out together in real time as a way of applying what they can see and what they already know to generate new information and, and learn from it rather than simply transmitting information to them. Um, in case conferences, that's about the deliberate use of pivot points that are prompts for discussion. So how do we do this? How do we execute this when we design our conferences? So let me show you how I've been doing it through the case that I've already used to illustrate these concepts in this presentation. So here are the three aliquots of case information that I have shown you so far in one big block. I could have shown them to you like this, but instead I decided to show them to you like this in three sequential components. The left side approach is called the whole case format. This is the format of the clinical pathologic conferences in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. This is a retrospective process. This is where the teaching of diagnostic thinking is implicit and completely dependent on the discussant and what they choose to focus on, and therefore what teaching agenda they might have. In contrast, the serial queue format simulates the real prospective process that clinicians experience when they're caring for a patient. It makes explicit the iterative nature of diagnostic thinking, including one that may be prone to error, where clinicians may be sidetracked by red herrings or false starts and make an anchor to information that ultimately becomes irrelevant. Um, and using the serial queue format can actually allow you to more in intentionally structure your teaching point. So let's come back to our case again. So I've already shared with you sort of the backstory of the patient. Now the patient gets some initial labs. I'm not going to go through the, the labs in detail during this presentation because that's not the focus of our conversation right now, but you can probably immediately uh, garner some important uh, key abnormalities from this case uh, as you look at this first bolus of information. Um, here's another bolus for you to, to sort of take more information away from this case. Um, and here's a final bonus, uh, a bolus of laboratory information for you to process here. So what, so to summarize so far, this is a 70-year-old woman with diabetes and CKD who's originally from India. She's got syndrome of subacute B symptoms, supraclavicular lymphadenopathy, jaundice, and encephalopathy, who has on labs vitamin D mediated hypercalcemia and an infiltrative pattern of liver enzyme abnormalities. So, what, I've, what have I illustrated for you in the way that I just showed the case? So, we are all very anchored to the traditional case presentation structure, which includes these elements, right? HPI, past medical history, exam, and labs. And we similarly anchor our clinical case conference structure to the same elements. When in reality, I think it often is more impactful to align the pivots based on clinical teaching points or pearls. So that might mean creating multiple stopping points within one section um, in order to highlight 
key aspects of history or laboratories that we want learners to take away. So in this case, it might mean pausing intentionally after each bolus of labs like I did so that learners can learn to process hypercalcemia or liver function test abnormalities or the workup of hypercalcemia and, and scaffold what they learn with each aliquot of information so that their learning becomes more solidified and concrete. Um, we can also uh, leave out entire sections. You've probably noticed that I completely neglected to tell you the family history or the social history for this patient. And that was intentional because that is not the goal of this teaching content. Um, and we should be thinking just as intentionally about all of our case presentations rather than adhering to the sort of traditional presentation format that we are all so used to. Um, we can also design our pivots based on steps in the diagnostic reasoning process, which might mean prompting discussions with very deliberate questions like, what are the key features in the case up to this point? What more would you ask about or examine? What is your approach to some key abnormality that has been identified in the case? So let's come back to the case one last time. So a CT of the abdomen and pelvis with intravenous contrast revealed diffuse heterogeneous hypoattenuation of the liver with moderate ascites. A transjugular liver biopsy was performed and pathology revealed poorly formed granulomas. Stains for bacteria, fungi, and acid fast bacilli were negative. Here are some representative images of the patient's CT scan. You can see the heterogeneous attenuation of the liver uh, on the right side there. Um, the patient's mental status unfortunately further declined, so she was intubated for airway protection and transferred to the intensive care unit. Her serologic tests for granulomatous infections, including an IGRA test for tuberculosis, Bartonella, Brucella, Oxyella, Coccidioides, and Blastomyces antibodies were all negative, as was a urine antigen test for histoplasma and an RPR. So we've kind of talked about designing pivots around steps in the diagnostic reasoning process. I think the last pivot that I wanna highlight is steps in the management reasoning process. And I think this is where sometimes the richest uh, questions for CPC arise from. So here are some explicit dilemmas that the clinician may be experiencing for this particular case. Should I start this patient on empiric therapy for hepatic tuberculosis? Should I start steroids for possible non-infectious granulomatous hepatitis? And beneath these explicit dilemmas are factors that may be hidden, but we wish to make explicit through our case conference. Like how do clinicians balance the unquantifiable risk of drug toxicity with hypothesized benefit? How much does prior experience or really anecdote for rare diseases bias this decision? How do clinicians prioritize diagnostic tests when time resources are limited? How do they weigh the benefits of earlier therapy against the risks of diagnostic delay? These are the sorts of questions that exist that a clinician may not make explicit in a whole case format, but that we have the ability in case conferences to make explicit and engage in that real conversation with the messiness of clinical data. So this dovetails nicely into the, the last segment here, which I'm going to, for this section, which is to ensure authenticity. So we all know that learners really value uh, when their attending physicians think out loud. So this is a, a study of the domains of um, uh, teaching attending practice that are associated with uh, better teaching evaluations. And I think the notable sort of quote from this study is that the strongest predictor of an attending physician's summary score was the frequency that attending physicians explicitly described their clinical reasoning when discussing clinical decisions. Um, and this process of thinking out loud, I think, has been re-sort of branded, I think, more recently as, as something called intellectual candor. And I'll, and I'll refer you to the citations that are on this slide uh, about very concrete strategies to model this when you're on rounds, uh, to model your own humility about medicine and your own fallibility, um, and the components of intellectual candor that we should seek to, to showcase in our case conferences are its unscripted nature. Um, the fact that it is deliberate, the goal for showcasing this humility is for learning. Um, it is supposed to be conversational and not the orchestrated, highly scripted CPCs of the case records of the Mass General Hospital. Um, and it's supposed to be stress-inducing. Um, learners 
uh, benefit from seeing uh, when experienced clinicians uh, don't know what's going on and how they problem solve in real time. And I think using case conferences to model intellectual candor is, is a real uh, uh, important, should be a really important goal. So how can we maintain and create authenticity? So obviously blinding is a key element, blinding of the audience with neutral titles, hidden or generic learning objectives, surprise discussions does not help our case when we present a CPC conference and send out our invitation to the conference with the discussants and their subspecialty. Um, blinding of the discussant, avoiding giving them leading answers to questions they might have, providing them with very curated aliquots of case information to replicate what clinicians at the time were really experiencing. Um, we can also maintain authenticity by moving from clinical vignettes to, to real clinical case conferences. I think many of us think that we are, we are engaging in, in clinical case conferences when we start a discussion of biomedical science with a clinical vignette, but clinical vignettes are hypothetical that are created to prompt discussion featuring contrived decision-making. They're very scripted. Clinical case conferences are designed to be, uh, to highlight the messiness of real clinical data and real clinical decision-making. Um, and I think that is their power. Um, this is a quote from one of the editors of the case records of the Mass General Hospital from decades ago, which I think still resonates with me for what the ultimate goal of that series was and should be. Um, it is less important to pinpoint the correct diagnosis than to present the logical and instructive analysis of the pertinent conditions involved. If the physician discussing the case emphasizes the practical clinical problems, it does not ma matter if the answer is wrong. So the last piece of this that I'm going to talk about this, this afternoon is the attendees who really often come to case conference to be entertained and to avoid being put on the spot. Problem here is that means that we are dissuaded from selecting bread and butter problems and we are dissuaded from incorporating meaningful audience participation. But I think both can be accomplished um, if done uh, intentionally. Um, so I wanted to highlight just a few innovations that that uh, me and some colleagues have engaged in over the last couple of years to highlight uh, how this can be done. So we created a clinical problem solving elective for medical students a couple of years ago uh, at the start of the pandemic, uh, where students spent a significant amount of time in small groups uh, doing pre-class assignments, tackling challenging cases, um, and then sharing their reasoning with experts uh, uh, expert clinicians over Zoom to see where they went uh, um, astray and to hear sort of the, the knowledge organization and frameworks that more experienced clinicians used. Um, we've created a new clinical case conference series for the residency program called Reason Up, where we focus specifically on reasoning skill development um, and, and engage the audience, I think, pretty uh, impactfully with collaborative documents to, to of lower that barrier to audience engagement. And we've led a variety of faculty development workshops, both for the Department of Medicine and for subspecialty divisions to enhance conference design. So let's come back to the case and wrap up. So the patient was empirically started on linezolid, ethambutol, and amikacin for tuberculosis. In parallel, she underwent an ultrasound-guided percutaneous liver biopsy. Pathology ultimately revealed a T-cell, histiocyte-rich, large, cell lymphoma. So um, I'm going to stop in the next couple of minutes just to highlight some potential ways we can innovate our clinical case conferences. And I wanted to sort of zoom back out and recognize that at its core, case-based teaching is all about making sense of uncertainty. This is what still connects our case conferences to the case method of law and business schools, where learners are tackling an unsolved problem or a problem with many solutions and trying to extract generalizable principles from it. And I think where we went astray is that the predominant uncertainty used to be in reaching a diagnosis. What is causing this patient's symptoms? But the new frontier of uncertainty, I think, is situated cognition, which is how do we most equitably apply uncertain evidence in an environment of scarce resources? And how do clinicians do that in real time? And I think 
thinking through thinking about case conferences in that way means that we will select better cases and better structure of these conferences to highlight that moment of uncertainty. So how can we do that? So have multidisciplinary or interprofessional case conferences so that we can share in the uncertainty that other professions tackling the same maybe bread and butter case are experiencing. Um, having case conferences highlight and contrast multi-institutional expertise as was done in, in a radiology conference that I featured here. Um, and then using conferences to explore barriers to care delivery. So rather than focus on the diagnosis, focus on what we did with the diagnosis after it was established. I think there are a variety of other things that I'm not gonna dive into here, including things at the subspecialty level and in undergraduate medical education that I'm happy to talk to you offline if you are interested in developing innovations in this space. So just to close, hopefully you've gained some additional perspective about where our clinical case conferences came from in medicine and the different forms that they can take, um, that we can be really more intentional about how we select cases, how we plan these conferences, and how we prepare our discussants achieve educational objectives far more effectively than just serendipity, um, and how there are many opportunities for us to transform our conferences at all levels of learner to better showcase and explore the challenges of clinical practice. Um, and I'll stop there and uh, take any questions in the last few minutes. Uh, thank you so much, Varun. I will first disclaimer that they suddenly decided to drill over my head in the office that I'm sitting in if you hear back on this. Okay. However, um, so that was um, extraordinary and fantastic. And um, and I uh, really have learned a lot about the way to think about this. Um, you have first off a question in the chat um, from Dr. Scott, who says, for trainees who give these sorts of talks to groups that are comprised mostly of people with more experience, so attendees often, or APPs even, I find it hard to choose a case based on what I've found interesting, challenging, exciting, confusing, um, uh, and feeling comfortable, confident it is appropriate for my more experienced audience. How do you think about that sort of presenter audience experience dichotomy when it's the trainee doing the teaching, the same framework you presented or a different approach? Uh, I think that's a great question uh, from uh, Dr. Scott. So I think, I think ultimately, uh, it is recognizing that learners and teachers uh, sh share the same clinical dilemmas. I think uh, even though I have gained a lot of familiarity with a lot of diagnoses and uh, sort of performance characteristics of tests and therapeutics, um, I still, you know, and, and I'm sure you, Dr. Armstrong, feel the same way. Um, we still get the same nervousness hair on the back of our neck when we see a patient with staph bacteremia that hasn't cleared in three days. Um, the same uncertainty exists, even though we know more. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think just recognizing that that uncertainty is shared and continues, even when your audience has sensibly more knowledge than, than you do as a trainee, actually, I think is more valuable than trying to find something that no one in the audience already knows. Um, you have a couple of questions on sort of audience participation. Um, uh, you've identified audience participation as a key to excellent learning, as well as an individual fear, as evidenced by the tendency of audience to sit as far away from the front row as possible. This is from Dr. Long. Besides conference structure, what suggestions do you have for faculty and learners to reset this culture? Um, and, uh, and other suggestions for how to impact audience engagement? No, I think that's a great question. And I think a, I think a big part of it is um, designing our conferences in a way that highlights uh, the ongoing uh, sort of, that highlights humility in our clinicians um, more effectively. I think we oftentimes, try to choose discussants and even prep our discussants in a way that sets them up for success. And that's really all that our learners see, um, but, but that's not what's going on uh, in our phones when we're on service and we don't know what's going on when we're texting all of our colleagues, hey, what would you do in this situation? And I wish that our conferences could start with like a text chain from the attending about the case 
uh, to show the learners in the audience, like, no, no one knew what the right thing to do was in this case. You are not alone. Um, I think that's one, which is modeling that humility uh, in the discussions of these conferences. Um, I think the other is uh, taking advantage of things that I showed in the presentation, like collaborative documents that anonymize audience participation um, and uh, allowing for audience participation in groups, allowing for gamification uh, so that learners feel like there is like a, a secondary goal uh, that kind of distracts them from the process of like putting their nickel down in front of everyone else. I think those two strategies I have found to be effective and helpful. Um, we are um, rapidly running out of time, um, but I have a couple more. Um, I do wanna sort of highlight a comment that was made. I love your emphasis on the value of vulnerability and authenticity. This is Dr. Bush. I think there's such a tendency to cover these things up, especially as the expert, but bringing everyone down to the level of finding the truth of a case and talking out reasoning is so important. And I think you, um, my question was going to be, but I'll get Dr. Grover's question instead. You know, uh, so much of what you presented is relevant to how we even think about a case, I think, and thinking about what the pivot points are and thinking about the framework um, and the frameworks um, that uh, help with diagnostic reasoning and um, limit um, error as, as well. Um, so last uh, last question. Um, most inpatient, you sort of alluded to this a little bit um, in one of your slides, but most inpatient medicine no longer follows the history of physical data sort of progression since people usually come through the ED or from clinic with some data available. Should we ever change the order of information that we present to match the conundrums that people encounter on the inpatient wards? If not, how should we handle what can sometimes feel like a disconnect between the conference and the clinical practice in terms of the order of operations? That's a great question uh, from Dr. Gromer, and uh, I will wholeheartedly agree that we should change the order. We should deviate from the, the classic order of presentations to better uh, model what the, the decision making that clinicians have to make, right? So you're the, you're the uh, admitting resident on the internal medicine service, and you're called about a new admission, and you open up the patient's chart, and the patient has a sodium of 105, and the decision that you have to make is not why is the patient hyponatremic, but should this patient be admitted to the floor? And um, that sort of decision-making needs to be highlighted in clinical case conference, just as much as the, the uncertainty of resource utilization in the hospital, not just the uncertainty of what causes severe hyponatremia. Um, and I think we should do that in subspecialty divisions too, right? Like we get called about patients who have reached a differentiated point that leads to subspecialist input, that oftentimes leads to anchoring bias on the part of the, of the subspecialist. And I think modeling how to de-anchor yourself from the reason that you were asked to see the patient is a level of uncertainty and skill that we need to model in case conferences uh, as much as figuring out what the patient actually has. Well, thank you so much, Varun. Um, this was fantastic. Um, and. Uh... And I guess we will call it a close. Thanks, everyone.